Lord, I, I pray today that all the words and lessons that I share, that you have put in my heart, are your words and not mine. I know that you are in control, and I pray that I can clearly and properly convey your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have, over the past few years, spent a lot of time studying and praying and reading about the last few weeks of Jesus' life. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I'm very interested in some particular parts of that that, I'm, that I may look to move on after seminary and write about, um, because it's of such interest to me. Um, so not just the last week um, leading up to the resurrection, but what leads up as Jesus in the gospel moves towards Jerusalem. And when you read that in the gospels, it's a change in the gospels. And they, they actually, on the road to Jerusalem is his road to crucifixion and resurrection. And it, it, the study at one point turned me to really have a hard look at one of Jesus' most misunderstood apostles. And the, this apostle was someone I thought I knew something about, and I thought that I had absolutely nothing in common with. I found out that he and I have a lot more in common, and he had a lot more to teach me than I had ever imagined. There are many lessons for his life, but um, I chose five to talk about today from this city slicker's life, as I call him, and I'll explain why that uh, God would have me share with you this morning. And I chose just five because there is a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. So, uh, Amen. <laughs> I hope not to hold you hostage, but pray that you will find some nuggets today that can help you like it's helped me. Today we're going to talk about a man who knew Jesus, but never really knew him. The man was Judas Iscariot. Who was Judas Iscariot? Judas is, is Judas's name is the same in as, as the word Judah or Jude or Judas in the Greek or Yehuda in the Hebrew. From the Hebrew, the name's root is Yod, and Yod means to throw out your hands towards God or something amazing and. Kind of like standing at the rim of the Grand Canyon for the first time and seeing it and throwing out your hands and say, Whoa! Look what God did. A number of years ago, uh, when my parents were still alive, we were together. Uh, we had flown into Salt Lake City, Utah, and we were coming over the mountain to Bear Lake. And my little Greek mother says in Greek, Di ekane of the os, when we come, which was like saying, Look! What God did as we looked down off that mountain in Bear Lake was just crystal blue below us. And it was just beautiful. And she was overcome with joy from seeing that, saying in Greek, What did God do? More fully, Judas's name means praise, or God is praised. How ironic. Iscariot is not his last name. There were not really last names, but descriptors. So, like Simon the leper, right? Or Jacob, son of Zebedee, or Jesus the Christ, or anointed one. Uh, no different here. Judas um, is Iscariot, which means from the Hebrew ish, or man, and kerioth, which is a place. So he was really a man from Kerioth, and Kerioth was 10 miles south of Hebron in the southern kingdom. In Hebrew construction, it compromises the towns and the city and the suburb, so it's kind of like saying he was a townsman or city man. So I've taken a poetic license, and I call him Judas the city slicker. Judas, the city slicker. So the city of Kerioth is in Judea. It's in the southern kingdom, not Israel, the northern kingdom. And why is this important? Well, there were apostles from. Where were they from? Well, in Acts 2-7, it 
it says, And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? So Judas was dead. Matthias had replaced him at that point in Acts. Eleven of the original apostles here, plus Matthias, were Galileans. So being Galileans, they were Benjamites. Or as Romans 9, 8 calls them, sons of promise. The northern kingdom of Israel had been lost when the kingdom fell more than seven centuries earlier because of her idolatry, and it had never been restored. But Judah, or the southern kingdom, was judged by God, sent into captivity in Babylon, and restored to their land 70 years later in 516. So it's important to note at this point in history, many of those in Judah were not really fully Hebrew. They were Edomites, which were descendants of Esau. They were Edomites. The Edomites were a cursed people. Malachi 1.4 says, If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may rebuild, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country, and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. I believe Judas was an Edomite. Judas never referred to himself as Judean. I believe that this city slicker, cursed Edomite, from the southern kingdom, was different from the other Galilean apostles. These Galilean apostles were sons of the promise. And today, when you hear Judas' name, you think betrayer, right? Well, who else was an Edomite? How about King Herod? So one cursed Edomite tried to kill baby Jesus, and Judas conspires to kill adult Jesus. That's just like God in order, isn't it? I think you will see that all this according is all this is according to the plan of God. Early in Scripture in Genesis, we find the proto evangel, or the first time the gospel is known. And uh, God says of Satan in Genesis 3.15, He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his, you shall bruise or crush his head, and he shall bruise your heel. The, the proto-evangelist, just a fancy word, meaning first gospel. This is the first time we see the gospel, Genesis 3 and 15, that in the Bible, yes, the first time the gospel was not in Matthew. It was in Genesis. Um, quite some time later, in the 41st Psalm, which was written by David in around 1015 B.C., we read the prediction of Judas. Even mine ally in whom I trusted, one eating my bread, made the great heel against me. Fulfilling, then, in Judas, nothing is a surprise to God. Nothing. Judas and Satan lifted their heel against Jesus, but then Jesus crushed their head. But even though life, the life of this man that lifted his heel against Jesus there, there are five lessons to point us about this city slicker that we can learn from the life of Judas. And lesson one, worship is not waste. So let me remind you of Judas' name. God is praised. Again, isn't that ironic? In John 11, we read that Jesus arrives in Bethany, where Martha and Mary lived, and whose brother was dead for four days. Jesus loved this family. He told them to roll away the stone where Lazarus was. And Martha said, wait, don't roll away the stone. It'll stink. He's been dead these four days. On Jesus' loud word, Lazarus, come out. A dead man was raised to life. Then in the very next chapter, Mary was with Judas. I want you to picture this with me. And they were reclining with Lazarus and Jesus. Were reclining. He was just in the tomb, covered in who knows what. 
And now he's reclining with Jesus. And here's his sister and his friends and his family. And imagine you're married. And you're looking at your beloved brother with God himself, who just raised him from the dead. And in John 12, 3, we read, Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. Mary worshipped him. It was expensive nard. Jesus said that that act of worship actually anointed him for burial, which is only a sh few short days away at this point. Mary worshipped, but Judas, who had witnessed the same miracle, he saw Lazarus come from the dead, said in verse 12, 5, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Sure, he would have given it to the poor, right? Judas saw this worship as waste. Worship is not waste. Jesus said in Matthew 4.10, You shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. You can't serve pure nard and Jesus. You, you can't worship money and Jesus. You can't waste on Jesus. You just can't do it. We are to worship God with our time, our money, our songs, our dance, our instruments, our arms, our obedience, in every way imaginable. Isaiah 43, 7 reads, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created from glory, whom I formed and made. We are created to worship. It is one of the chief ends of man. We often think worship is only for God, but in fact, we have a need to worship, and only true fulfillment in life can be found when we worship. So we are not just pouring out and it's all for God. It changes us. When we worship, we become changed. When we fail to worship him, there is a missing piece of ourselves. So worship fulfills us. Worship fulfills a deep longing that actually satisfies. I promise you, if you truly worship him, you will never be the same. We are called in the Old Testament to worship God in many ways. It's barak, which is to kneel or bow down, or halal, which is to boast, celebrate, be clamorously foolish. I love that. We are to halal, to be clamorously foolish. Foolish. David danced naked almost in front of God and to, to when they moved the, uh, the ark. Or Shabbat, to shout loudly. Or to help Tehillah. My Hebrew is not as good as my Greek. Sing praises and be spontaneous. Or Tauda, extend hands in thanksgiving. Or Yada, which is extend your hands vigorously. Or Zama, which is to make music with instruments. You have to lay it all out. You have to worship with everything you have. In sports, we might say we left it all on the field, meaning that we give everything we had, that there was nothing left to give. It was our first and our best. We have to leave it all on the altar. When things go great, praise him. When things go bad, praise him. When you get up, praise him. When you lie down, praise him. When you are happy, praise him. When you are sad, praise him. When you are rich, praise him. If you are poor, praise him. Worship will challenge you, especially when you give God every ounce of your worship. Worship is not waste. What about you? Do you see worship as waste or as thankful devotion to the creator of the universe who gave you every good thing? Are you going through the motions on Sunday but not really giving him everything? Are you praising him only on Sunday? What happened to Monday and Tuesday? That leads us to lesson number two. Is give all you have. 
not a portion. So Judas wanted to give a little, but not a lot. He wanted to give some, but not all. He had a partial commitment, but not a total commitment. Judas had an attitude like some of us do today, which is, hey, before you throw that away, why don't you see if the church needs it? That's our worst and our last. God wants our first and our best. Mark 12, 30 commands us saying, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus calls this the great and first commandment. Jesus was quoting the Shema here and from Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5, which is recited often by Jews, even to this day, at home and in the synagogues. And by the way, when you look back at worship, I want to mention that the Hebrews worshipped at home. And it wasn't until late in the Second Temple period when there were synagogues that people began to worship corporately. So your worship, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, should be in your home. You should be singing praises to God. You should be reading the Bible. You should be praying because your home is where the micro churches, local churches here, the micro church is your home. It's your house. All your mind means to purify or change your minds to be like Jesus, to rid ourselves of our own ego and let God take control of our thinking. Flee that stinking thinking and see yourselves how God sees you. But it's not enough just to have intellectual assent. And you know that George Washington lived, and you can assent to that in your mind, and you might see Jesus the same way. You can assent that he existed, but he must take your heart and your soul as well, or you will miss him by 16 inches. When the Bible says all your heart, it means the ruling center of your whole being, wherefrom sprouts all desires and emotions. This center was not just of spiritual activity, but of all of life. The soul is a deeper yet love than even the heart. Past knowing, it goes to faith that God not only exists, but that he loves you so much that he would send his only son to die for you. Spurgeon says, the great preacher here in America, with all your heart means intensely, with all your soul means sincerely and most lovingly, and with all your strength means with all your energy, with every faculty, with every possibility of our nature. We are to give God our first and our best, not our last and worst. When you give Sunday, but not Saturday. When you give, when you give him our heads, but not our hearts. When you give him extra, but not the tithe. When you give him our soul, but not our mind. And then we wonder why we're not living out the life he intended us to. We give a portion, partially because we're not willing to truly be changed by him. That leads us to the third point, is that you have to be willing to change. Judas refused to change. We often use the word repent. It's actually the Greek word Metanoias or metanoia. And the word literally means like metatag to change. Nois is your brain, your mind. Literally means to change your mind, to conform to the mind of God. Judas never repented. He refused to change. When the, when the twelve were first chosen, Jesus said in John 6 70, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. The difference between a devil or slanderer and the slanderer Lucifer, there is a difference between the two. The Greek word devil, diabolos, means slanderer par excellence. Judas started out a devil, and three years later he was still a devil. Keep this in mind. Judas was present. He walked with the God of the universe incarnate in human flesh. 
He watched him feed 5,000 men plus women and children with a little boy's lunch. He watched him calm the storm on the waters. He saw him with a front row seat raise Lazarus from the dead after multiple days in the grave. He listened at Jesus' feet at the Sermon on the Mount. He saw with his eyes perfect evidence. With his ears, he heard the best teaching from Jesus himself. With his feet, he followed Jesus throughout Galilee, witnessing all of his ministry. He saw all of this firsthand, but he refused to change. Judas, Judas wanted to keep doing what he'd always done and keep thinking what he'd always thought. What about you? Have you changed? Not enough that you hear or see or be around Jesus. You have to change. There are plenty of people who call themselves Christians that are in churches all over the world. They, they sit for the proclamation of the word just like you are today. They hear it week in and week out. They may even listen to sermons during the week. They see miracles, things that defy earthly logic. They've seen them. They watch as Christians trust God and see their life transformed. They see people get healed by the power of God. They fellowship after service and in small groups. They never change. They never met that noise that changed their mind. If Jesus hasn't changed you and isn't still changing you, you need to ask yourself if you're really his. Maybe you've forgotten about him. Maybe the cares of this world are choking out your walk and your witness. Are you becoming more like Jesus every day or more like the world? Would you be convicted in a court of law of being a Christian? Is there enough evidence that you have changed and that you're different from the world that you would be convicted of being a Christian? Would your acquaintances and co-workers know that you're Christian? Do your family and closest friends even know? Or are your actions not equal to your supposed convictions? Actually, the problem may be that you know about him, but you don't know him. That brings us to lesson four. It's not enough to know about him. Matthew 26, 47 to 50. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man who sees him, and he will come up to Jesus at once. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. So verse 48 there says, Now the betrayer, the Greek word is paradidos, it's from close beside, to turn over from close knowledge, is a specific type of betrayer, somebody who knew him well. That's betrayal. Jesus knew about Jesus. He was close beside him. He traveled with him, spent time with him, and then he kissed him. And the Greek word means to kiss down passionately and fervently, showering him with kisses, kissing affectionately like someone you know very, very well. Again, I, ironic, isn't it? I wonder how many of us kiss the face of Jesus all over the cell now. Are we close by to him, but we don't really know him? There is a distinct difference. Interestingly, as much as Jesus, Judas thought he knew Jesus, he didn't know him at all. We read in verse 49, he comes up to Jesus and says, Greetings, Rabbi. He used the same term earlier in the evening during the Passover dinner. The Last Supper we see in Matthew 26. When it was evening, starting in verse 
20. When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, One after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes, as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Can you see this now in your mind's eye? Matthew comes up and he says, Lord, is it I? Luke says, Lord, is it I? And Mark is it, says, is it I? And John says, Lord, is it I? One after another, 11 disciples say, Lord, Lord, is it I? And Judas says, Rabbi, is it I? There is a big difference between calling Jesus Lord or teacher. He only knew him as teacher, not Lord. He never made the transition from his head to his heart and soul. Have you? Is he only your teacher or is he your Lord? See, many believe that Jesus really called him friend later. In 2650, it says, friend, do what you came to do. Um, so he could have used the Greek word, for instance, agapi. He could have said, you know, uh, agapi. Like you would say, someone I love unconditionally. You would say in Greek, agapi, my love, or my friend of love. He could have said, me, uh, the phileo, or like you think, Philadelphia, the city of Delphia. Philo, philio, or philo means a friend. A true friend. He didn't use either one of those words, you see. We only have one Greek, uh, English word, friend. But in the Greek, he used the word ethios, which means companion. But not just a regular companion. It's an imposter. Posing to be a comrade, but in reality, only has his own interest in mind. Changes the meaning, doesn't it? A supposed friend, an imposter acting for self gain. Do you know Jesus as Agapi? Philo or Ethios? I pray that you know him a different way than Ethios, because that's how Judas knew Jesus. You can know him as Agapi today. It's not too late. And that brings us to our final point is that redemption is available for all. Even after all the betrayal, even after only giving a portion, even after not changing and not really knowing him, even after seeing worship as waste, he still had a choice, just like we do today. Eternity begins now. C.S. Lewis made the comment, I have never met a mere mortal. The question is not whether you will live forever. The question is where you will live forever. For Judas, it was still not too late. After all he had done, and all he didn't do, it was not too late. But then he made a choice. Matthew 27, we read, that when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put that money into the treasury since it's blood money. So they took counsel and brought with them, bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what has been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, 
And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price paid of him on whom the price had been set by some of the sons of Israel. And they gave for him the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Verse 27, 3 says he changed his mind. So did Jesus, I mean, Judas finally change? Was it metanois? No, uh, it was not. It was not the Greek word metanois. It was a different Greek word, metamelis, which is a word for regret, not repentance. So he had remorse for what he did, but it did not lead to a change of heart or repentance. It led to regret, so much regret that he threw the 30 pieces of silver into the temple. Nothing, nothing in the Bible was on accident. Nothing. Why was it 30 pieces of silver? Read in Exodus 21 32. If an ox gores a slave, male or female, the owner shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver. Who is it that came to serve and not be served? Who was the greatest servant of all time? Who served us enough to die for us? The price for betraying Jesus was the price of a servant who was killed. Exactly the same. And we see further illustrated in Zechariah 11, when Zechariah became the shepherd of the flock, doomed for slaughter. Zechariah 11, 12, and 13. Then I said to them, it seems good, If it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver, then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. The lordly price at which I priced them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord, to the potter. By the way, Zechariah was complete by 470 BC. Keep in mind who our shepherd is. John 10 pictures Jesus as the good shepherd. Pastor and shepherd are the same interchangeable word in the Greek, in the Bible. What did Zechariah the shepherd do with those wages of the book? The Bible is reliable. These prophetic books look forward in time to Jesus and are pointing right at him. Who is the real potter? With the sum, they purchased the potter's field. Isaiah 64, 8 says, We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are the work of your hand. So who is our potter? God is the potter. We're the clay. So then they purchased figuratively God, or his field, the potter, or Jesus' field, with blood money. Jesus' is blood money. We took this journey about silver and prices of slaves and potters and shepherds to talk about choice. So you see, in this field was a tree. <laughs> this is actually a Judas tree. It's a, I'm going to get, I'm not good at Latin either. It's a Cerces siliquastrum. That's its Latin name, and it's now called the Judas tree. But you know what? It didn't have to be called the Judas tree. Judas made a choice to hang himself on it and spill his blood all over it. So they renamed it the field of blood. There was another choice. So in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Really, this was grace and law, life and death. Adam and Eve had a choice and chose wrong. Judas had two trees. The Judas tree or the cross. There's still two trees. He could have chosen the cross, and he didn't. After all he had done, he could still have chosen the tree of life, of grace, the cross. Jesus could 
Judas could have chosen Jesus' precious blood and instead choose to spill his own. Whose blood will you use in your life? What tree do you choose? Only two choices. Maybe you're sitting here and saying, okay, I'm Judas. I did a lot of that <laughs> as I was looking at Judas. I mean, how often are we perfect in serving Jesus and always trying to move towards him? But maybe you have a dim view of worship. Maybe you give Jesus some, but not all. Have you known about him, but you don't really know him? Maybe you've not really changed. Maybe you've never really met him. Today could be your day. Jesus is calling you today to learn from Judas and not be like him. Make different decisions, better decisions. If you need to worship him, do it. If you need to come and give him everything, do it. If you need to know him and not just know about him, come begin that journey. If you've never really changed, now's the time. So speaking of worship, I guess we have a closing worship song. And worship is not waste. Let's worship him. Thank you.